We're at the University of California, Davis. I'm a member of the Department of Chemistry and also in the medical school in biochemistry. Ovarian cancer has been one of these things that's been always in my mind ever since my mother passed away about 10 years ago from it. And so we, I looked into it and it turned out that it was one of these diseases that if there was a, um, a disease that needed a marker, it was ovarian cancer. So we took it upon ourselves to, to look at changes in glycosylation in ovarian cancer and, and looking at how uh, perhaps if we simply cleave off the glycans in serum, we could develop a, a test for uh, ovarian cancer. It's been known for maybe about 50 years that um, oligosaccharides or, or the glycans change in the progression of many diseases. There's about 50 years of glycobiology that says that uh, in cancer, for example, uh, the oligosaccharides change. And essentially what we wanted to do was to look at the, the global effects on how oligosaccharides were changing and use that as a diagnostic marker for certain diseases, and particularly cancer. Started taking serum uh, and, and started to look at the, the glycans on the proteins of serum. And we released them and, and just from a very naive way initially looked at the glycans and looked at the signals that were produced by, by serum. Uh, we managed to get collaboration between, um, Davis is a very big medical school and uh, the, the specialty is in uh, family practice. And so I called up several uh, colleagues of mine at the medical school and I said, uh, do you have any samples that we could probably try out? So they gave us, they found five samples of um, cancer patients and then five normal samples. And then we, we went ahead and, and just started to analyze those and when we looked at it, we were seeing mass spectrum. In fact, my students and my postdocs kept bringing up these spectra to me. And, and although we could determine the difference between cancer and no cancer, we didn't know what the structures were or what they should have looked like because we didn't have uh, the bioinformatics tool at the moment and there wasn't a lot done on serum glycome. Quite incredible what we were seeing was that we could actually tell the difference between the five with the cancer and the five the normal. I was giving a, a presentation in a, a meeting, in a UPO meeting in Korea, and I was talking about what we were observing with the glycans and the mass spectrometry, and how, although we could differentiate, we weren't able to tell what the molecular, what the molecules were, because the, the molecules were fragmenting. And after my talk, I talked to uh, Rudy Grimm was in the audience, who's um, uh, the product manager for Agilent, and what he he told me about this new device called a chip TOF. Essentially, it was a microchip device that did nano LC separation with a time of flight mass analyzer. Uh, and he was telling me things that first I couldn't believe, but he gave us access to the instrument uh, that allowed us to profile the serum glycome. And what we saw were, were quite, uh, quite amazing. We were able to observe not only the separations of the individual isomers, uh, the, again, these are glycans from uh, glycoproteins, but we were able to get very high accurate masses. And my, my specialty is uh, Fourier transform, ion cyclotron resonance, which produces very uh, high resolution and high mass accuracy signals. Yet the time of flight that we, that we, that we were uh, using uh, had similar performance to the FTICR and, and so that allowed us to obtain not only the composition but we were also able to uh, separate them into the individual isomers that, uh, that should have been present in the serum glycome itself. However, when we tried the instrument, the, the chip TOF, what we were able to do was we were able to separate the compounds into individual components. So this gave us another level of um, of differentiation. Before we were simply looking at compositions of the compounds, but now we can actually look at the individual isomer. And we thought that this would actually give you more robust markers. Uh, and if we were able to see differentiation in, in, in an instrument that was giving us fragmentation, 
perhaps without the fragments, we could get much better differentiation. When we were looking at the serum glycome, we already had another project in the lab, and essentially what we were doing was dissecting human milk to try to figure out what were the components of milk. Uh, milk we were using as a model for the perfect food. Well, essentially we've been eating for millions of years, but we don't really know what we're supposed to eat. And so we thought that b milk being the perfect food for infant, if we could determine the components of human milk, we can also figure out what we should be eating. And one of the uh, largest components of human milk are the oligosaccharides. And the oligosaccharides in milk was also thought to be uh, a very diverse and, and large number of compounds. People were estimating that there were thousands and thousands of compounds in milk, uh, essentially of oligosaccharides. Well, we took the whole mixture of milk oligosaccharides and separated them in the chip top. And there too what we found was that the, the mixture was not as complicated as it was. So we were quite pleased with that because then that means that the job that we had to do was a lot simpler than, we, than, than many had envisioned it to be. And more importantly, we were able to feed the oligosaccharides to gut bacteria. And what we found was that the oligosaccharides in milk was actually, which had no uh, nutritional benefit to the infant, was actually food for the gut bacteria. And in fact, the oligosaccharides in milk established the proper gut flora for infants. Through these findings, we were able to profile the milk glycome, and we hadn't realized how important this was. There hasn't been a, a, a study where they looked at all the milk oligosaccharides simultaneously, and where people were actually able to determine what the, 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 the main purpose of the oligosaccharides were. And so uh, we got quite a bit of uh, uh, interest in it, and in fact, it became a, a, a the cover story for a, a latest, the latest issue of Chemical and Engineering News. The Agilent Nano LC chip is well integrated to the time of flight. What that means is that the reproducibility is, is excellent. When we started this project, we thought that, or many people thought, that oligosaccharide analysis would be far too complicated and we would not ever be able to analyze a full glycome. With the microchip device, we're seeing that the glycome is not as complicated as people think it is. And in fact, we may be able to analyze an oligosaccharide simply based on a couple of parameters. Uh, one of those is what we plan on using is the retention time. So what the chip TOF offers for us is retention time, which is highly reproducible, and the accurate mass. And what this does is it provides us with a way of identifying new oligosaccharides and old ones whose structures are known. And I think in a big way this is really going to forward oligosaccharide analysis. Because every time you identify an oligosaccharide or every time you find a new structure, you can essentially identify whether that structure is already known or whether it's a new structure. And that gives you a much better way of looking at oligosaccharides. And, and I think it's going to progress the field in a very important way. As we move on to the future, our partnership with Agilent is going to enable us to explore new possibilities in terms of glycan analysis and to really solve, I believe, the, the glycan problem and the glycan code. The instrument that we have right now is the, the TOF MS. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to get reproducible retention time with the chip attached to it and, uh, again, high mass accuracy. The next generation of these instruments are the QTOF, which will allow us to obtain 10 mms. So now having the retention time, the accurate mass, and the 10 mms will give a surefire way, a surefire way of determining what the compound is again and again and again. And so in the future, what we're going to have is a method by which every glycan structure will essentially be characterized in a way that 
uh, will allow it to be identified over and over again. And this is what's been missing in the field of glycan analysis. Uh, the future of our research lies in two areas, and that is disease marker discovery and, and nutrition. In terms of disease marker discovery, I think we're very close to doing uh, uh, blinded studies to determine the robustness of some of these glycan biomarkers. And I think in the future what you'll see is that glycan biomarkers will, will make it to the marketplace as an actual diagnosis for cancer. Uh, in terms of nutrition, what we plan to do is explore further the milk, uh, milk products, milk glycome, milk glycoproteome, and look for active compounds that could be useful, not just nutritionally, but even pharmaceutically. This could include uh, things such as oligosaccharides that may have antimicrobial properties, uh, antiviral properties. There's a large amount of opportunities, I think, that's going to be available with these compounds. What the CHIPTOF and the CHIPQTOF is going to do is it's, going, it's enabling technology that allows people like myself to be able to explore uh, a lot of these possibilities in a somewhat systematic but very reproducible ways. In conclusion, I think my partnership with Agilent is going to open up new possibilities for us and we're looking forward to the new challenges but also uh, excited about the new developments and the new types of research that we can do with this type of instrumentation.